We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Stand and sing with us. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. besides you nor is there any rock like our God amen? amen nobody is holy like he is and nobody is our rock like our God we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the
people. He is worthy. He is worthy of our praise. Turn around and tell three people that. Thank you for the cross.
morning and ask you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Genesis. First of all, the book of Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2. And then we'll be turning to Revelation chapter 21. Genesis 2 and Revelation chapter 21. God willing, in the coming Sundays, I'm going to be sharing with you about a place where those of us who love Jesus will one day go. God's Word is accurate. He tells us exactly what He wants us to know about the places that we have never seen. And much is talked about in the Bible about heaven. But oftentimes we allow our preconceived ideas, even when we read the plain black and white text, to override what we read. This happens in a lot of areas, but it really happens about those things that we have been taught. So in the coming days, I want to ask you to just give me a chance to teach you the truth about heaven. Because I have found out that many of God's people are not really anxious about going there. And I think one of the reasons is we don't understand it. We don't understand its purpose. We don't understand our purpose. We think somehow that we're going to be disembodied spirits the rest of our days or that when we get a body, all we're going to be doing is one great worship service. And the reason for that is we don't understand what worship is in the Bible. And so God's very plain about that. And so over the coming weeks, we're going to be exposed to truth that you've already read, but you might not have recognized. And so again, I just ask you to give me a chance to teach you God's Word, because I believe it'll change your life. The Scripture says that we're to set our affection on things above. This is what Paul told the church at Colossae. To set our affection on things above where Christ sits, the Messiah sits at the right hand of God. Not on earthly things. You see, everything here will one day pass away. God's going to make all things new, and we'll learn about that in just a moment. But in Genesis chapter 1, God gives us a summary of creation. 
Now, when I went to school, I was taught all of these uh, theories of creation and all the theories of authorship of the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And I want to tell you, it's probably the greatest waste of time I ever spent. You don't have to wonder about creation. God tells us exactly about creation in Genesis 1 and 2. And many of my colleagues, many of my fellow pastors say they believe the Bible from cover to cover. They believe in the inerrant Word of God and they'll fight you if you say anything other than that. But yet as I've talked with them and I've preached in their churches and I have counsel with them and taught them, I have found out that they only believe the Bible is the Word of God starting at Genesis 3. Where the fall of man took place. They really don't believe that God created heaven and the earth and everything in it in six days. They don't believe, as the Bible says, it was six days. Not millions and billions of years. There's no such thing as that in the Bible period. Nowhere. You say, what about science? Do I really need to talk with you about science? <laughs> Do I really need to talk with you about science and what we have observed about science over the last 12 to 15 months? Ch science changes with the political whims of the day. The Word of God remains forever. Amen. The grass will wither. The flower will fade. But the Word of our God will stand forever. Amen. And the Bible says that in six days God created the heavens and the earth, not just our solar system, but all of the solar systems. He created everything. And the Bible says that He put us on this planet on purpose for a purpose. And so I talk with those who have a scientific background and they say, do you really believe that God did what he said in Genesis? And I tell them without equivocation, I have the same credentials you do, sir. I have the same credentials you do, ma'am. And I believe every word of the Bible is true. And that starts at Genesis 1. So in Genesis 1, we have a summary. Unlike what the liberal professors say, that this was one writer who wrote and used the name Elohim, the name, the general name for God. And then in chapter 2, he used the word uh, Adonai. It's, it's uh, spoken Adonai, but it's YHVH. It's the Tetragrammaton. It's four letters. Nobody knows how to pronounce the name of God. We in the West pronounce it Yahweh or Yahweh, but nobody knows how to pronounce it. And so the Jews just say Hashem, the name. And so that's in Genesis chapter 2 because there's two names, Elohim in Genesis 1 and uh, 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 Hashem, the name in in, in chapter 2, some say that that was two different writers. But what they don't understand is the God of the Bible. You see, the word Elohim is what is used in Genesis 1-1. Bereshit bara Elohim, eight hashemayim, b'eit ha'aretz. In the beginning, God, the great God, the creator God, he created the heaven and the earth, the heavens and the earth, everything that's within them. But then, if you'll notice, at the end of chapter 1, the Scripture has a break at what we would call Genesis 2-1. But there is no break in the original text. You see, the chapter and verse divisions are not inspired. The words are. The chapter divisions did not come along until 1225 A.D., just a few hundred years ago. And by the way, thank God that Robert Stephanos uh, put those in or, or Stephen Langton put those in. But then the verse divisions didn't come along until the 1500s, just a few hundred years ago. 
and I'm so glad they're there, but sometimes they miss it. What we call chapter 1 doesn't end until the end of chapter 2 and verse 3. That's when the thought ends. So chapter 1 actually goes down, if we were doing it by the actual Hebrew text, uh, chapter 1 goes all the way down to chapter 2 and verse 3, and then in verse 4, uh, the first sectioning begins in Genesis. Now, why am I telling you that? Because the Scripture says that thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, and on the seventh day God ended His work, which He had done, and He rested on the seventh day from all the work which He had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. And that's the end of what we would call the first chapter. And then you have the first section beginning with, this is the history, this is the genealogy, the Hebrew words told doth. And it's used ten times to create ten sections of new beginnings in the book of Genesis. Now why am I telling you that? Because God ended his six days of creation by creating man. Now understand the way that God made us to think. God makes us to think, and we understand things from the big picture down to the details. If God wants to tell us something, he tells us the big picture, and then we get into the details. This is why we many times miss what God has to say because we're so interested in the minutiae of a word or a verse instead of getting the big picture. God's book is the story of God's redemptive work of creation and recreation. It starts with the heaven and the earth and it ends with the new heavens and the new earth. And in between is the story of the fall of man, his sinfulness, God's redemptive acts and work over and over and over again to the point to where ultimately God steps out of eternity into time and he himself redeems the creation. And now the entire earth is groaning, the entire Heavens are groaning. The universe is groaning. Romans chapter 8, the apostle Paul said, all of creation, all of creation, everything, all the universes that, that fell when man sinned, who was the caretaker of all of this, the Bible says they are groaning until the day of the redemptions of the Son of God, of the sons of God, all of us. So that's what I want to tell you about. And the reason that God's gives this great summary statement, which we call Genesis chapter 1, is because he wanted to get to man, which was the apex of his creation. Only man, it says, is created in the image of God. God made us like him. He made us in his image. And the Bible says that he came down and talked with man face to face in a garden that he had planted. Now let's look at that. The scripture says in, um, in chapter 2, and let's just look at verse 7. And the Lord God formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living being, a living soul. Now remember, God created everything, chapter 1. He gave the big statement, chapter 1, the big summary statement, just like if you're going to write a thesis. Just like I wrote my doctoral dissertation, the thesis before that. What I do is summarize what I'm going to tell you. And then I tell you what I told you I was going to tell you. <laughs> That's what a thesis is. That's what a dissertation is. You give the big general statement and then you put the chapters in. You put the Roman numeral 1, the Roman numeral 2, the Roman numeral 3, and then the A and the B and the C and then the 1 and the 2 and the 3. What we want to do is get down the 1, 2, and 3 and say, I don't understand it all. Well, the reason is you've never gotten the big picture. Go back to the thesis statement. God had a plan. God had a plan. And man's Failure did not thwart God's plan. Amen. Now think about it. 
The way the story is presented is God had all of this perfect creation and Satan, who had been cast out of heaven, came and tempted man away and he caused man to fall and man fell. God's plan fell. Now he's on plan B. Oh, no. <laughs> the will of man cannot thwart the will of God. God had a beginning and God will have an end and it will end exactly the way he wants it to end. You know why? He's God. Amen. No one can thwart the eternal will of God. No man, no angel, no devil. And so the Bible says, And the Lord God planted man, and formed man out of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul, a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden. Well, I'd like to spend some time here talking to you about where God formed Adam and what eastward means. But that's for another day. The Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made every tree grow that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And look at this. And the tree of life was also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now the, the tree of life was placed there on purpose. It was in the middle of the garden. Of all the trees, of everything that was there, this was the key tree, not the knowledge, tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was there for another purpose. But the tree of life was there for a specific purpose. And when, when Adam sinned, God said, I don't want him eating of the tree of life. Not yet. He didn't say I'll never eat of it again. But he said, in essence, I'm going to take it away from him now. And so the Bible says he put an anointed cherub, cherubim, plural, cherub, an anointed cherub, that's, who Lucifer was. Lucifer was one of the angel class called a cherubim. There are various classes of angels. The cherub is the highest because it is that which guards the glory of Almighty God. There are the saraph, the burning one. Seraphim, the seraphim of Isaiah chapter 6. That's a Hebrew word, seraphim. It means burning ones. You read about them. They're descriptive. It says that they had six wings. With two they covered their face, two they covered their feet, and two they flew around. And their job day and night is to sing, Holy, 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 the Lord God Almighty. You say, you mean that's what they do? Oh, yes, and they love it. <laughs> They're doing what they were created to do. And let me just parenthetically say, you will never love life, until, truly love life, until you're doing what God created you to do. And so, this was in the Garden of Eden. And God said, you cannot come back in. Not, you cannot come back in, ever. You cannot come back in because it's not time. Now, we don't hear about this garden anymore until we come to the New Testament. And Jesus, when he was on the cross, said to the thief that was beside of him, there were two criminals, one on either side. It's called a, uh, a thief, but there's no word klepto there. They were two malefactors, the King James says. They were bad boys. Mal means bad. They were criminals, one on either side. We just call them a thief. They were criminals on either side. One was saying, won't you get us down from here? If you're who you say you are, won't you get us down from here? The other one said, leave him alone. You and I deserve to be here. He doesn't deserve any of this. And then he said to the Lord in a repentant heart and voice, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I believe that sign above you that says, 
this is the king of the Jews. And Jesus turned to him and said, today you will be with me in paradiso. Today you will be with me in paradiso. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now I spoke the other night at uh, the funeral that many of you uh, attended for the McLaughlin family, for Miss Peggy, and I talked about paradiso. You see, paradiso, that's not a Hebrew word, that's not an Aramaic word. Aramaic is the word that Jesus, the language Jesus would have spoken. It's Chaldean, it's modern day Iraqi. It's the language after the exile that the Jews spoke in their everyday home life because they learned it from the Babylonians. Hebrew was spoken in the temple, in the synagogues, and in some homes, but mostly it was Aramaic, and, and it's in the book of Daniel, it's in Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, but it's mostly the Old Testament, 99% uh, of it is in Hebrew, but there's some Aramaic text. So there's Hebrew, Aramaic, and then the New Testament, it's the Koine Greek, the common language of Alexander, the great. And so it's written in Greek. This word, paradisa, is not Hebrew, it's not Aramaic, it's not Greek, it's Farsi. Farsi is Persian. And this is the language of the great kingdom of the Persians, of the Iranians today. They speak Farsi. Iran changed its name after World War I to Iran, but it was Persia before that. They're the Persian people. They're not Arab people. They're Persian people. They have their own language. It's Farsi. Paradesa was the description of the garden of King Cyrus, King Cyrus, the great King Cyrus that in 539 gave the decree to go for the Jews to go back and rebuild what we call the second temple. Now listen to me. The word paradiso refers to a walled-in garden, a protected garden. It was a place that was the most beautiful place in all the realm of King Cyrus, which was a huge kingdom. It went all the way to Europe, uh, what is modern-day Turkey, all of the Middle East today, northern Africa. It was a huge kingdom, and everywhere the Persian troops would go, Cyrus decreed that they would bring back flora and fauna from there, trees and flowers and plants, and uh, the... Uh, uh, the uh, uh, great, beautiful uh, plants from everywhere. And so they would bring them back. He would plant them and they would water them. And they, it was this beautiful garden. It was the most beautiful place in all the realm. And you could only come into that garden if you were friends and family of the king. And if you were friends and family of the king, you could only come by personal invitation. And when you came in the garden, he would walk with you. He would talk with you. He would introduce you to the rest of the family. And at that point, Cyrus would take off his royal robes and he would say, ask me anything and I'll tell you the answer concerning my kingdom. It was a place of intimacy and fellowship. And he would say, this came from here, this came from there, and our battles here, we won this, and... This is from there, and the people were just absolutely dumbfounded. It was a wonderful place. It was the most secure place in all the realm. You couldn't get in. And so you were there, you were in perfect peace. You could eat anything you wanted to because, after all, you were with the king of the mightiest kingdom of the day. And so this is paradisa. Jesus said, today you will be with me in God's beautiful garden. As a matter of fact, in the Hebrew text, when it's translated into Hebrew, it's translated Gan Ben Eden. Gan is the Hebrew word for garden. Ba is a preposition of or in. Eden, in Eden. Today you will be with me in the garden of Eden. Where are those departed dead who died in Christ? Wherever they are, wherever they are, listen to me. Paul told the suffering church at Thessaloniki who had believed that when their loved ones had died, they had gone away and lost hope. The apostle Paul tried to encourage them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 when he said, I would not have you to be agnostics. I would not have you to be agnao. I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have died. He used the 
physical term sleep. For those who have died in Jesus, why? That you sorrow not as others who have no hope, who have no expectancy, who are not looking forward to anything. You see, those without God have no expectancy but torment after death. And that's a sorrowful thing. And those of us who have lost loved ones who have died in Jesus, are we sorrowful? Yes, we're sorrowful. Do we mourn? Yes, we mourn. Do we grieve? Yes, we grieve. Do we miss them? Yes, we miss them. But we do not sorrow as those who have no hope. We have hope. We have expectancy. Hope in the Bible is not wishful thinking. It is the word elpida, elpis, E-L-P-I-S, elpida, E-L-P-I-D-A. And it's the word for, listen to me, for excited expectation, eager anticipation that what God says is true. After all, we don't take a leap into darkness when we exercise faith. It is a leap into light. We're not trusting a God who cannot be trusted. We're not trusting the word of a being who cannot be trusted. We are trusting a God who has proven himself faithful at everything he's ever said. He's never lied. God cannot lie. Whatever God says, take it to the bank. It's true. And God says, I'm going to prepare a place. And today you will be with me in the Garden of Eden. Amen. So the question is not where are they, but what are they? What are they doing? What do they know? Now we're getting down to it. Okay, let's look at this. Turn with me, if you would, to the book of Revelation, chapter 21. Now, let me just say to you that the word paradise, I, paradise, I, paradise is only mentioned three times in the New Testament. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 23, that I quoted to you. It's mentioned in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul talked about being caught up into the third heaven. That's Greek terminology. He was writing in Greek. That's Greek terminology. You see the heaven above us, what we call our atmosphere. The Greeks call that the first heaven. What we see, the blue sky. But the stellar heavens beyond our atmosphere, that's the second heaven. The third heaven is the abode of God, the place where God dwells. That's the home of God. You say, where is it? He doesn't tell us. But it's there. See, the Bible's not complete in details, but the details he gives us, they're truthful. They're accurate. And so Paul said, I was caught up into the third heaven that people at Corinth would have understand. Remember, every Bible writer from Moses to John assumed that the people to whom they were writing understood the language, understood the history, the, the geography, the cultural context of the day. Every Corinthian knew that he was talking about the very abode of God. He said, I was caught up into the third heaven, the very abode of God, the very place where God lives. And he said, I saw things that in syllable or sentence I can't express. Amen. See, I'm just a little bit wary. Just a little bit. I'm not saying they don't happen because I do believe that there are out-of-body experiences. But let me tell you, the Apostle Paul had a pretty good vocabulary. Let me say that again. I think that went right over some of your heads. The Apostle Paul who wrote most of the New Testament, who studied, who was fluent in several languages, one of which was Greek, which is a very descriptive and colorful language. Hebrew, which is the most majestic language that the world has ever known. That's the language that God chose to talk about creation in all of its glory, about God and all of his glory. That's a pretty majestic language. Paul was one of the greatest learned scholars of his day. 
He would have had a triple PhD, for those of you who are asking. And so he said, I saw things I can't, uh, I can't even describe. And he said, I heard things that I can't repeat. Why? Because it was bad? No, it was good. It was so good he couldn't even, he didn't even have the words. He said, I was caught up in the third heaven, into the abode of God, into the very paradise of God. He went to the Garden of Eden. That's where he saw all this stuff. That's where he heard all these things. That's the second time it's used. The third is in Revelation chapter 2, which if you had come on Saturday night, you'd hear about next week. In uh, Revelation chapter 2, no, I know Saturday night's your own. I'm just, I'm just messing with you here. Ease up a little bit. I'm not fussing at you. And in Revelation chapter 2, the Bible says, he said to the church at Ephesus, to those of you who overcome and love me, he said, I will give you to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. See, the tree of life wasn't done away with. It was guarded and protected so no one could get to it in their fallen state. Now, let's pick up in the book of Revelation. Let's go to chapter 21. Now let me set the context for you. There has been seven years of great tribulation. Thlipsis megale. Thlipsis is the word for crushing. This is the word that Jesus used to describe the tribulation. That's uh, a mortar and a pestle. That For those of you who have seen pharmacy signs, and it has a little bowl, a mortar, then it has a little pestle, and, and that mallet, you crush herbs and spices to make medicinal healing quality. That crushing by that pestle is called thlipsis. Jesus said there is a day coming that has never been. It's not ordinary suffering. It's the wrath of God's going to be poured out upon the earth. And that's called the thlipsis, the megale, the mega crushing, the great crushing. We call it the great tribulation. But the earth is going to be crushed under the weight of the wrath of Almighty God. The Bible at one point says it is like grapes being crushed in the wine press of the wrath of Almighty God. The great tribulation is not persecution, it's not suffering. The Bible says that one-third, one-third of the entire earth will be killed at one time. One-third of the population. It's estimated right now by demographers that there are over nine billion people on the earth with a B. If that's true and the tribulation were to start in the next few years, that means that three billion would be killed at one time. The mind cannot grasp that. The Bible says one-third of the oceans, which most of the earth is, will be polluted at one time. One-third of the fresh water in all the earth would be polluted at one time. Billions killed. There's never been a time like this. Jesus called it the Megale Thlipsis, the Great Crushing. That's already passed. Jesus has come back and he set up a, his kingdom from Jerusalem. And you and I will be with him. You and I will reign with him there. And then after a thousand years of peace and prosperity, where billions more will repopulate the earth and will come to know the Messiah as the true king of the universe. But yet there will be billions more that will rebel after years of, thousand years of peace and prosperity. It's hard to get a hold of. You see, our government and the governments of the earth have never, ever really gotten it unless they are biblically based. Our forefathers knew this. By the way, this is why they set up our government where it's hard to pass laws 
on purpose so that there's not a dictator like we have right now making rules. I remember very plainly Obama and every, it's not just Obama, it's not just Democrats, it's Republicans and uh, Democrats. When they get in office, they start giving these executive orders and they give, give unelected officials, which most of our government is, the ability to make laws without ever going through Congress. It's called regulations, which have the effect of laws. See, our forefathers warned about this because they know how devious and deceptive and how wicked the human heart is. And so they made it difficult. We've got to watch where we are right now. We're in bad, bad shape. It didn't just start with Joe Biden, President Joe Biden. It started long before that. So don't blame a Republican or a Democrat. Blame the wickedness of humanity. And so there has been a thousand years, what I'm trying to tell you, a thousand years where everything's good and still there's wickedness. See, most governments, we've tried all these things, and, and this is important that you understand because we've got to relate this to where we are. Don't you remember the experiments of the 60s? You go to Knoxville with me, and I'll take you to housing projects. We did work in them all the time. Beautiful, beautiful homes, beautiful home, once beautiful. Housing projects all over North. Come to Chicago, Illinois with me. Come to New York City. Come to L.A. with me. I've been in those cities. I've been in those boroughs. I've been in those suburbs. I've been in those what are now ghettos and slums. They were once beautiful housing divisions. And they took people and they brought them in and they put them there in the most beautiful surroundings with gardens and plants and streams and fountains and, and running water and showers and this, that, and other. And what happened? The wickedness of the human heart took over, and they became slums and ghettos. Why is that? Because the goal is not to get people out of the slums and into beautiful places, but get the slums out of the human heart. And only God can do that. We've never gotten that. And so we keep pumping money and, and millions of dollars and effort into trying to put people in nice places so they'll act nicely. It doesn't work that way. It's the heart. So after a thousand years of, of a man who dies at a hundred years of age, the Bible says everybody will say he was so young. He was like a baby. Read the Bible. That's what it says. It's as though a child dies if a man dies at 100 during those times. The wolf will lie down with the lamb. There's going to be the antediluvian days brought back before the great Noahic flood. You see, before the flood, the animals weren't afraid of people. It was only after the flood, according to Genesis chapter 9, that the fear of man came upon animals. And the Bible says the lion will not eat meat, but it'll eat straw like an oxen. That's the way it was meant to do. Wow, you mean that's going to happen during the millennial? It's what it says. I believe it. You say, well, I can't get my mind around that. Well, welcome to the human race. Our minds are finite. Call them whatever you want to. We are finite. We're limited. God is transcendent and infinite. He knows it all. We don't. Yeah. We think we do, but we don't. Right. And so, after all of that, the great white throne judgment, now, now, everybody, everybody is waiting. And the scripture says, without taking a deep breath, John said, Look at the last verse of chapter 20. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here we are. We only have all of us who have been saved down through the ages and those who are saved billions during the kingdom. 
Now what? Well, God's plan wasn't thwarted. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first heaven passed away, and there was no more sea. Wait just a minute. I saw a new heaven. Where is that? And a new earth. Where is that? That's here. The word is not new as in a new creation. The word is kainos. That's the word for new as in kind, in quality. You see, the earth that we live on is the earth where one day God is going to renew and restore to its original pristine creation. You say, how do you know? That's what it says. A new heaven and a new earth. Now, I am going to take you next week through the scriptures to show you that this is the same earth that we're on. You see, God's not going to create a new universe. Why? Because God's plan wasn't thwarted by sin. There's a new heaven and a new earth. And look what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away. That is the same language. You say, wait just a minute. It can't be the same earth because it's got to be something new. It's got to be something new because I've always thought it's got to be something new. <laughs> no, I've talked to a lot of people, and the eyes that I was making is what they make toward me. <laughs> and so, is that true? Well, let's just look at the other ways the word kainos is used. For instance, the Bible says when you and I are saved, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that you and I become new creations in Christ. Behold, old things are passed away. Behold, I'm still Tony. <laughs> saved, redeemed. But I'm still Tony. I mean, when I got saved, I still looked like me. Now, I changed. Don't, don't worry. I changed. I had hair down on my back. It was out here. You think my hair's a little curly in behind? You should, you should see it when it's out over my shoulders. Oh, I look different. There's no doubt about it. These ears hadn't seen daylight in years. And everybody said, you know what they said? What happened, Crispy? You're like a new man. Yeah. Oh, did I just say Crispy? <laughs> yeah, that's what they said. Crispy, you're the same man. But you're different. What is it? God made me a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. But I'm still the same person. Amen. God will make the earth new and the heavens new, but... Oh, is it going to be different? Same earth, but different. Now, next week, I'm going to tell you how that process goes. And you've got to come, because I don't have time. <laughs> but listen, it's a new heaven. And look what it says. I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth that passed away. And there was no more sea. I'll talk to you about that. Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, oh, watch this, very important. Behold, the tabernacle, the skinne of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain, no more suffering. For the former things have passed away. Amen. Hold on. Wait a minute. A new heavens and a new earth, and now they're coming together, and God is going to dwell with men. You mean God is going to come to earth, and the heaven, the abode of God, is going to be one with the earth, and he's going to, he's going to have a central city? That's what it says. Now, interestingly enough, this is the same setup God had with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Before sin. 
You know, the Bible doesn't say that Adam went up to heaven and talked with God. And, and, he, and he went up and talked with God in his abode. No. The Bible says that heaven came down. God came down and walked with Adam. He talked with Adam. God came to where Adam was. Hmm. So Adam blew it. So how are we going to fix it? God said, you don't think that threw me, did you? I mean, when Adam sinned, God went, oops, I didn't see that coming. That's the way we talk. God knew it is said before the foundation of the earth. He knew that man would fall. So what did he do? He devised a plan before you and I were ever made. He said, wait just a minute. He knew all that and he still did it. Now there you go again trying to figure God out. <laughs> just listen. And so God came down to where Adam was. Adam sinned. God said, I can't do that anymore, but one day I'm going to fix you. And God Spoke to his prophets. He spoke through the Torah, the law, the Ten Commandments. He spoke out of bushes. He spoke out of donkeys' mouths. He spoke out of prophets. And they said, one day God's going to fix it. And the angels of heaven, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, said, God, tell us. The Bible says they desired to look into how God was going to do it. And God got everything ready. And the Bible says... But about the time of Passover, during the lambing season, God came down to earth again. And this time, they called his name Jesus because he would save his people from their sins. Now the angels knew how it was going to be, and so they they couldn't stand it any longer and they went to some shepherds who were right nearby and the Bible says they said when they appeared the shepherds went huh! it says they were I love the King James sore afraid it means they were terrified that's the word they were terrified they went huh! it's an angel and they said first thing what they said don't be afraid why you got to hear. You have. Are you ready? This is it. Today, this day, is born right over there in Bethlehem. The Messiah, the Anointed One, the one that was promised to Adam that would crush the tempter's head. He's born right over there. And this will be a sign to you, shepherds, you Levitical shepherds, who are out here wrapping up those, those. Sacrificial lambs, you know how you wrap those little lambs because next year at this time at Passover they're going to be bought and they're going to be slain up here for Passover so God could see the blood in Passover. You know, you make sure that they don't have a, a blemish or a spot so you wrap them up as soon as they're born. You snuggle them, you swaddle them is the word. You do that with these sacrificial lambs. But tonight... I'm going to give you a sign. You'll know about this. This will be a sign unto you. You will find the babe swaddled. Why? Because he's the lamb that will take away the sin of the world. You'll find him wrapped in swaddling clothes. He'll be lying in a manger. And the angels of God couldn't stand it anymore. And they broke out all over heaven and said, Glory to God in the highest peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. God has come to earth. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God is with us again. And so when God wanted to fix things, he came personally to do it. So he went back to heaven. After they crucified him, he rose from the dead, went back to heaven. And so the scripture says, when all is said and done, look, the tabernacle of God, the dwelling place of God, the place where God dwells is with them. 
and they shall be his people. And God himself, God himself, personal pronoun, it's reflexive. God, he's already said he's going to dwell with them. God himself. You say, yeah, but I mean, it's, it's going to himself. How much plainer can he make this? He himself will be with them and be their God. And then God's going to wipe away all tears. Now, I've, I've got to tell you, there will be tears between now and then. Because, you see, God has a plan to make everything new. You say, well, I don't understand. Well, keep coming. Go get your friends and have them to come. And we'll talk about it because the Bible says a whole lot about God and tears and when they'll be dried up and when they won't be dried up. And so it says... God will wipe away every tear from their eye. There shall be no more death, no sorrow, no crying. There shall be no more pain. The word for pain is the word for suffering, by the way. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things kainos, new. Not chronos, as in time, but kainos, as in quality. He said to me, right, for these things are faithful and true. And he said, it's done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. The Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter. I am the A to Z. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. Wow. Turn to chapter 22. What is this great fountain of life? Chapter 22, and he showed me a pure river of the water of life. Clear as a crystal. Now, let me tell you about this word clear. Almost everywhere else it's not translated clear. It's translated brilliant. Shining. Effervescent. Just to look at this river will knock your eyes out. It's not just clear. It's crystal clear. Not only is it just crystal clear, it's shiny clear. You think you've seen some pretty rivers, headwaters? I'm telling you. This thing, you're going to look at it even with glorified eyes and you're going to go, yikes. I mean, this is some kind of beautiful. It's indescribable. No, nobody can even describe this river. Crystal clear, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of his street and on either side of the river. <gasps> Look at this, mark this, verse 2, 22, 2, 2, colon, 2. Mark that. Look what it says. In the middle of the street, in the midst of the street, where is that in the middle of this celestial city? In the middle of the street and on either side of the river was the tree of life. It didn't vanish after all. You see, even the devil's greatest plans can't mess up the plans of God. This is why you and I don't need to be fretting as others who have no hope. We, you and I don't need to be going, oh, what are we going to do? Oh, my, the world is crashing down. I'm going to lose everything. Why are we acting like that? God is in heaven. God is in control. Will we in this life suffer? Yes. We've not suffered for the name of Jesus. We've suffered for being obnoxious, for being rude, for being lazy, for being uncaring. You name it, we suffer for it. Bad decisions, bad financial decisions, bad Relationship decisions. Do I need to describe this? I mean, do, this is why we suffer. We in America don't suffer for Jesus' sake. Heads are not being cut off for Jesus' sake in America. It might by some radical, but not by our government. We're not persecuted. You see, a lot of the persecution you hear about is so you'll send in money to help some organization. They scare people to death. 
What you and I need to do is fall on our faces before God, get right with God, and then get up and live like Jesus. That will change America more than any law. We need a heart change. You can pass all the laws you want to. You'll never change the heart with the law. If a law could have changed the heart, the Ten Commandments would have done it. But all they do, they're God's ten white horses plowing up the heart of man to get him ready to plant the gospel seed. That's all that the Ten Commandments are. In the middle of this garden of this paradise is a tree of life. And look at this. It bore 12 fruits. Now there's a fruit of the month club. <laughs> Have you tasted this month? Oh, it is delicious. What does it taste like? I can't even tell you. <laughs> Never been anything like it. No, listen. This is real. Bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. And look at this. You can eat the leaves. And the leaves of the tree were for the therapeuo of the nations. Just to eat its leaves was therapeutic, was healing. I didn't get to eat any fruit today. Did you eat a leaf? Man, those leaves, I'm telling you, I got energy I've never had before. <laughs> no, this is the kind of things. You say, wait just a minute, you're making this, you're making this uh, uh, so down to earth. Yeah, that's the way God communicates with us. See, there's going to be great continuity in heaven. Now, you need to get excited about going to heaven because there's great continuity there. Now, in the days ahead, because, whoa, time is running out. My time right now, not, you know. <laughs> Listen. There's great continuity. God's not going to take anything away from us here except the bad stuff. No, we move up to first class. Amen. No, it's big. Amen. You say, well, what about, you know, I love my wife and my husband. Are they going to be there? Oh, yeah, they're going to be there. And if they're saved, you're going to know them. And the relationship you had with them here, as good as it was here, it's going to be better there. You think God's going to give you any less there? No, he's going to just take away the bad parts, and everybody's got bad parts. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, are you say my marriage is not all it needs to be? Yes. <laughs> That's exactly what I'm saying. I tell you, I remember, I remember at Plans Day. This was back years ago. This happens every now and then now. And years ago, I had flown quite a bit. Karen and I had been going overseas to Israel. And I'd been so much, the same lady was at Ben Gurion Airport. And I saw her and she said, hello, Dr. Crisp, good to see you. And I go, well, any chance? Uh, and I, I was always asking, can I uh, bump up to first class? Because I don't know if you know it or not, but first class and coach are real different. <laughs> no, I mean, they, they really are different. And really, the, the, it's stark difference now. Yeah. I mean, now, if you've not been on a plane lately and flown first class, you say, I've never flown cl first class. I can't even describe it to you. It's like, you know... She came and she said, I've moved you and your wife to first class. And I thought in my mind, this is not funny. She said, no, I moved you to first class. We got to get on first. That means there was room for all of our baggage. Not only that, but we sat down and they said, can I bring you a drink? We have, and they named all of these alcoholic beverages that everybody was just... Uh, I said, uh, you got any Coke? She said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll have it on ice. <laughs> she brought it right before the plane ever took off. They brought us pajamas. I'm not kidding you. They brought us pajamas. <laughs> because they said, do you want pajamas? I said, come on. 
They said, no, we really have pajamas. You don't want to sleep in what you got. I said, sleep? See, it's an 11-hour flight back. I said, yeah, I'll have a pair. I never wore them. I saved them. I still have them. Karen put hers right on. I've still got them. I wanted to prove because I knew my family wouldn't believe it. So anyway, I digress. And so we were, we were on the plane, and I realized I could, I, by the way, I had a 19-inch TV in front of me. Yeah, and I had, they gave me a, 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 a bag, and it had all the toiletries that I had already put in a plastic baggie. I mean, it was wonderful. They even had little booties I could put on. They had a thing for my eyes that I could put on. It's amazing. And they gave me, I mean, it was like Bose headphones. Not those little, you have to cram in your ear all the time. They, and you pay $3 for, they actually work. And, and so then they said, you can lay all the way back. And I just kept on laying back. And sure enough, that thing would go horizontal. And I thought, now this is the way to go. This is the way to go. Never at one time did I think, hmm, boy, I wish I was in coach. <laughs> as soon as we got up cruising, they didn't say, chicken or beef, chicken or beef, chicken or beef. No, they came by and said, we have three entrees tonight. <laughs> And what they named would have cost you a fortune in a restaurant. And after that, they said, save room. We'll be bringing the ice, cart, uh, the ice cream cart with Sundays in just a moment. They came and had all kinds of ice cream. Oh, this is on a plane, first class, coming back from Israel. And they made me a Sunday, and I built one. I mean, I <laughs> built one. Now... <laughs> You know, I, I mean, I'm a country boy. I said, now this is with the ticket, right? I mean, this is. And so they said, yeah, so I mean, I built one. I ate that thing. And man, it kicked in. So I'm getting sleepy. <laughs> I laid down and slept like a baby. I was as rested as though I had slept in my own bed. It was absolutely wonderful. I had a full pillow, full blanket. It was wonderful. I even left a little nightlight on. It was great. Again, not once did I say, you know, I had wonderful friends in coach. Not one time did I thought, boy, I need to go switch places with them. <laughs> no, I'm telling you, heaven is an upgrade. Amen. Don't worry. I'm going, to eat, I'm going to answer a lot of questions. You write out of the Bible. You're going to love it because you'll have an authoritative source. We're going to answer the questions. Are there going to be animals in heaven? I'll answer that for you. You're going to like the answer. Animals will be in heaven. You mean little Fifi will be in heaven? <laughs> Now, I didn't say little Fifi would be in heaven. I said there'll be animals in heaven. Will we eat in heaven? Oh, yes. Not just the tree of life. We will eat in heaven. Anything that we do here that is meaningful to you, and I'll answer the question, yes, that some of you right now are thinking, I know. Will there be sex in heaven? No, there will not be. And I'll tell you why. You see, God has already answered a lot of these things. We just read over it over the years. Yeah. Whatever heaven is, it is going to be more than you could ever dream. And you're going to want to go there. And when you get there, you will be astonished at what God has prepared for those who love him. Let's pray. Lord, we need you. Our minds are so small. We're so limited. 
But God, you are absolutely everything to us. The greatest thing about heaven we know will be that we will be with you. Your presence will comfort us and keep us. We'll have peace like we've never known, joy like we've never known. No sorrow, no pain, no suffering, no more sad goodbyes. We'll be together forever. May we look and long for that place. May it remind us that life is fleeting. It'll be gone in an instant. It's a vapor. It's a puff of smoke and it's gone. May it cause us to have courage in this dark and sinful world in which we live. And to find hope, expectation, anticipation that everything you said is true and so many things that you can't even tell us because they're so great. So Lord, hear our prayer. And if there is anyone here that is not sure of heaven, may they make sure of that today. And for those of us who already know that we're on our way because of Jesus and our relationship with you, May it cause us to rejoice, be excited about what's coming. In Jesus' name.